2003 Suzuki Aereo with a 2.0 liter engine. History on this vehicle, this came in needing a head gasket. The cylinder head was off of the engine. Of course, the timing chains were off too. Once the vehicle was put back together, it's basically a no start. If it does start, which is on occasion, it only runs for a few seconds and shuts off. And what we're gonna do is walk through a no start diagnosis on this vehicle. Okay, so we're looking for direction. And the direction we're going is, are we missing spark? Are we missing fuel? Do we have a compression problem? Uh, one of the first things that we've done already, which I'm not going to show, is we looked at scan data, we looked for trouble codes. Uh, we had no trouble codes in memory, so really no help with the scan tool. We did have an RPM signal during cranking, which is a good indication that our cam and crank signals are okay. The next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna check for spark. Okay, of course there are multiple ways that we can verify that spark is occurring on this vehicle. We could use a scope, we can put an amp probe on each coil and look at the ramps, we can look at the primary control. Um, in this case, I'm just gonna dumb it down and we're just gonna use a spark tester on one of the coils and we're just gonna do a visual inspection and see if we have spark taking place. Can uh, you go ahead and crank that for me? Okay, good. So as you can see in that shot, we do have spark. Uh, there's really no reason to check all four because the car doesn't start. And so we're going to assume that the other three have spark at this point. We're gonna go after fuel next. Okay, once again, there are multiple ways to verify that fuel is getting into this vehicle. We could put a fuel pressure gauge on the rail. We can measure fuel pressure. Uh, then we could do injection pulse testing either with a noid light or we could use a scope and look at uh, a waveform, either voltage or current. But in this case, again, I'm looking for kind of speed here and this is an acceptable method. And what I'm gonna do is use propane and I'm just gonna put propane in the intake. I'm gonna use the uh, brake booster hose and I am going to put a fuel source into this intake. We'll see the result of that. Uh, go ahead and crank it. Okay, good. You saw the result of that test that this engine didn't even try to start when we added propane to the intake. And so what that tells us is most likely this is not a fuel problem either. You notice where I put the propane was into the brake booster hose. The reason I didn't go into the intake is we have a mass airflow sensor that sits right here and I didn't want to risk having any fuel source uh, damaging that hot wire mass airflow during a crank when it was active. So we're saying at this point we have good spark and good fuel. The next thing we're going to do, go after compression. Okay, so I have a compression gauge installed into the number four. Uh, remove the spark plug, pull the coil out, unplug the primary so we don't overload the coil. And uh, go ahead and crank it. Let's see what we got. Okay. So you see we have about 125 pounds of compression. You would think that'd be enough for the engine to start. I'm not sure what the spec is on this engine. Something else to consider is cylinder wash at this point. We've been cranking this thing for a while. We have the injectors firing and you know, maybe putting a little bit of oil in the cylinder might bring that up a little bit. In fact, we could probably show that. So I'll throw a little oil in the cylinder. We'll see what it does next. Okay, so I got a little bit of oil in the cylinder. I uh, got the throttle open. We're gonna crank it again. Okay. And we came up to about 150. So you see we Definitely had a little bit of cylinder wash going on there, but the fact is, is that's enough compression for this engine to run. So the next direction we're going is we need to verify timing on this engine. Okay, there are multiple ways to identify whether or not you have a timing problem. As far as the cam timing being off, whether it be a belt or a chain, that's what we're going after now. Visual inspection, of course. On this engine, that's not really an option. Uh, there is a test that I want to review first. It's in my book, uh, section one, page 21 in particular. There's a few pages in there on 
relative compression testing and that's what we're going to do. I actually have a couple videos on doing this. Uh, so we're going to use that method on this car not just to check uh, those compression waveforms but to see in time where this spark is occurring. So the tool I'm using, a high amp probe, um, I'm putting this on the battery cable that goes to the starter and I am also going to connect the second channel up to the ignition coil uh, control wire. So a little bit different than the info that I have in my book on the signal because I was using secondary to sync or synchronize the signals. In this case, I'm going to use the computer's base circuit turn on signal. The, on this coil design, the transistor is actually inside of the coil. I'm going to use the computer's turn on, turn off signal for that coil that's going to tell me where the spark's going to occur at. So we're going to use this signal on, on the harness side in relation to the starter current pumps on the screen. We're going to put those together and see where the timing is on this engine. Okay, just real quick on the settings on this, channel A, that's going to be my turn on, turn off signal for the coil, and channel B, that's going to be my starter current, and I'm going to crank it. We'll take a look at the waveform. I'll freeze that. We'll go back and take a look. I'm going to zoom in on this just a little bit. Okay, what the red humps represent on the screen would be compression pressures. And of course, the peak of those uh, compression pressures would be in this area. So that would be one cylinder at top dead center compression. This is another cylinder top dead center compression, another and another. And so you can see uh, these two blue traces up here would be the turn on turn off signal of that one ignition coil so from that point between the two cursors what we have is four cylinders actually firing so it's repeating itself that would be 720 degrees of crank rotation more importantly though right now is is we want to look at the turn off of this if you know a little bit about ignition systems that when we turn the transistor off for a primary circuit, that is when our spark is going to occur. And what this is showing me here is my spark is occurring nowhere near top dead center. Top dead center would be roughly in this area. And you see that that cursor, the second one over here, the turn off of this blue square wave is not occurring anywhere near the top of that relative compression peak. So we definitely have a timing problem here. Let's go a little further. Okay, so we're gonna do a little bit of math and what I wanna to try to figure out is what the degree is that this spark is occurring in relation to top dead center. And to do that, I'm gonna uh, do it this way. I'm going to measure uh, the total time of 720 degrees of crank rotation. So this would be between my two cursors right now. We have 595 milliseconds. That's for two complete crankshaft rot rotations at 595 milliseconds. So we're going to take 720 degrees and we're going to divide that by 595. What that's going to tell me is we are at 1.21 degrees of crankshaft rotation per millisecond. 1.21, remember that number, 1.21. So now we come over here and our first cursor we still have near top dead center. And again, this is not exact, but it's going to put us close. And we're going to measure between these two cursors now. The second cursor over here is where our spark is occurring and we're at 27 milliseconds. So we'll take that 1.21 number, 27 times 
1.21 and that's telling me that my spark on this engine is occurring at 32 roughly 32 degrees after top dead center that our ignition timing is occurring on this engine and that is completely wrong on every car you want to be very very near top dead center near zero degrees uh, again this is not an exact science on what I'm doing right here uh, because we don't truly know where top dead center is on this red trace but it's putting us close this is good enough to tell us we have for sure a timing problem I'm going to show you guys one other method okay the next test I want to show is using the pressure transducer to do the same kind of test and what we're going to do is we're going to monitor the pressure in the cylinder using a pressure transducer uh, that would be the Fluke PV350 and I'm using my Pico scope for the signal so what we're going to do monitor the pressure in one cylinder and we're going to also monitor that same coil control signal we're going to compare the two see the result okay and here's the waveform of that Go back and take a look at that. These pressure pulses on the on the red trace are a little bit more clear as far as where top dead center is. And you see that uh, this pattern, instead of looking at, at four pulses or three pulses in between, we're just looking at the one cylinder now. We're not looking at them all. Uh, the peak of these red pulses would represent top dead center compression in the number four cylinder and so that would be at that point right there and again the number four cylinder firing again 720 degrees later so between those two cursors again roughly we have 720 degrees of crank rotation and we're occurring at 609 milliseconds now so let's do that math again 720 divided by 609 we have a a uh, 1.18 degrees per millisecond 1.18 degrees per millisecond and again the tail end of this square wave is where the spark is occurring that's where the transistor turns off that's where the spark occurs and that's occurring at 25 milliseconds after top dead center so 1.18 times 25 and we have a 29.5 degrees this spark is occurring roughly 30 degrees after top dead center this is absolutely confirmed our problem on this car is our spark timing is way off so now we need to address why. Okay, as far as timing goes on this engine, what we found is a little bit, little bit of discrepancy on design. When we pulled the wiring diagram, it shows a crank sensor and cam sensor separate, but we can't find a crank sensor on this engine. When you read the description in operation, it tells you that all of your ignition timing, all the coil firings are done off of the cam sensor. And what we found out about this cam sensor is this cam sensor provides both crankshaft and camshaft information. It has two separate signals. It has a high data rate signal and a low data rate signal. Very, very uh, similar to a distributor design optical pickup that they used in Nissan and, and uh, Mitsubishi and across the board. So pretty sure all of our timing is done by this. And the thing about this cam sensor is it only goes in one way it is actually a little kind of distributor but it only goes in one way and so that means that it wasn't installed incorrectly and the guys actually were smart about it and put a scribe mark on it where it was before they pulled it apart and so what we know is our problem is not going to be in here um, that our timing uh, is most likely going to be from a chain that was installed improperly 
and so we're actually going to go that direction next now on some engines you can actually do a camshaft crankshaft correlation or relationship test again using a scope and you can figure out whether or not you have an issue there on this engine that's not possible because they're both inside of here so that test isn't going to help us we're actually going to have to pull this cover off now and see what's going on with this timing chain all right uh the, the timing is definitely off i'm gonna do my best to show you where our problem is um we had started pulling it back apart before i realized i, I forgot to shoot this part uh, lower tensioner we already have off we're getting ready to move the chains that primary chain that goes from the crank down there to this intermediate sprocket behind the two cams is actually off one tooth and there's some colored links you have to use uh, they use the wrong link and uh, the two cams if you look at the front of the cam you're gonna see a mark uh, two arrows lighting's hard to do here point it out to you guys um, there is a mark here and there is a mark here and those get lined up with some flat marks on the back of the head there's one right here I don't know if you guys can see that and there's one if I take the camera show you move the angle there's one right here so those flat spots is where it's supposed to line up now, if you look at the intake cam it's actually lined up where it needs to be Let's see if I get a shot of that But that intake cam, you see the flat spot behind and this mark on the front. But that is lined up pretty close. But you look at the exhaust cam, and again, the exhaust cam uh, is, is the one that is driving our distributor, which is on the other side over there. It's really not a distributor, it's a cam sensor, but uh, you look at this exhaust cam and it is off two teeth. We are two teeth off on that exhaust cam. So that explains why our timing is way off. Uh, we're gonna line everything back up. I'll show you the after picture and I'll try to give you at least a somewhat decent description on how to do this. Okay, our first timing chain, which would be the primary timing chain, is done and aligned by using colored links on the chain. And what you wanna remember uh, is our yellow plate needs to be on the crank timing sprocket and our Dark blue plate needs to be on the, uh, what they call the idler sprocket. This was backwards when our students did this. Um, they had these two reversed and they are one teeth off. They're not even. So we counted 24 teeth on one side, 25 on the other. And so it's very, very important that this step is followed. I'm gonna show you on the car now. Okay, so here's your lower timing mark and it is that copper link that we want to use they call it yellow in the on the procedure the copper link gets lined up there's a dot on the uh timing sprocket right above it there's a dot right below and uh, i'll show you the top uh idler sprocket next okay you see the top gear top idler sprocket we're looking behind the cam gear we're looking down in here there's a blue link it doesn't really look blue on the camera but that blue link is lined up with the dot on the sprocket and the reason why this procedure is so important is there is no mark on the housing for the upper gear to reference to and so that's why it's super critical that you get these colored links in the right location otherwise you're going to be off a tooth on your main chain which is going to throw your two cams off a tooth as well next part we're going to line up the cam gears now okay lining up the cam chain now and there's three marks on this one there's actually a there's a blue link here, gets lined up with that arrow. There is a blue link on the other cam, and there is a yellow or copper link underneath that you can't see on this idler sprocket. I'm gonna show you with an inspection mirror, I'll show you that one. And then to double check yourself, it's kinda nice, they give you those flat spot, spots that I was pointing out to you guys earlier, that that, that mark right there lines up with that flat spot behind it and this mark here lines up with this flat spot behind it now that looks like from this angle that that's one tooth off still it's not it's just the angle that this engine's sitting in here and the angle of my camera I'll show you these marks again with an inspection mirror 
Okay, got the inspection mirror on the bottom of this idler chain or idler sprocket. And you can see a copper link right there. And you see that that is in fact centered with that arrow that is on the sprocket itself. So that bottom one is good. Uh, I showed you the two um, blue links on the top already, but the check is going to be this flat spot. Okay, showing you the mark on the exhaust cam. You see that that uh, with the inspection mirror, you see that cut in the in the uh, sprocket is lined up with that flat spot in the back. Hopefully, you can see that. Pretty tough to hold an inspection mirror and the camera at the same time, but that is definitely lined up. Okay. Go to the uh, intake side now. Okay, looking at the intake cam, this one's a lot more clear. I can show you that that uh, mark on the gear lined up with that flat spot on the back of the head. So we are good. Quick review of all of our marks. Again, go down to the crank and we should have our copper mark lined up. You see the mark on the gear, the copper link, mark on the block, come up top, intermediate sprocket, or the idler sprocket, that blue mark, just to the right, I'm looking, see if I can point it out, I'm looking right, right here. So that blue mark lined up with the dot on the idler sprocket, no block mark on the upper area for that. That's why the links were very important and where they went. And then I just showed you the alignment of the two cam gears. And it's important that uh, when you line this up that you have the arrows right. The arrows point toward the blue marks and the cut marks, which is 180 degrees from that, or the slits, they point to the flat parts behind there we should be good to go. That, should, that, that explains our cam timing being off, that explains our ignition timing being off. Again, last comment, this exhaust cam drives this optical distributor, optical dummy shaft distributor that uh, contains a cam and crank signal that threw our ignition timing off in relation to our compression. And uh, yeah, we were about two teeth off it looked like. We had a couple problems. Primary chain was off a tooth, threw the secondary chains off and I believe the secondary chains weren't really put on right either, but we're back into alignment. We'll see if we get an after shot now of these waveforms. Okay, we got everything back together. And uh, what I wanna show before we even attempt to start this vehicle, which we have not yet, is I want to do the same checks we were doing, which is cranking uh, compression compared to where the ignition firing event is. So still using a pressure transducer in the number four cylinder and I'm using a um, my second channel for the base circuit control signal of the coil for the number four. I have the injectors disabled. So keep the engine from trying to start and uh, let's go back to the Pico and take a look. Okay, I still have the frozen picture on here from before. Another nice feature of this Pico scope is you take a, a captured picture, load it back up, connect your um, connections back up, hit the space bar and start it again, and your settings are all the way they were before. So nice feature of the Pico scope for sure. Uh, but you see where our timing was in relation to top dead center. This is before still. Uh, looking at, help move this cursor out of the way so you get an idea. Where this cursor is, again, is where the ignition was taking place before we reset the chains. Um, let me uh, move this cursor out of the way for a second. Start this picture. All right, go ahead and crank it for me. Keep cranking, keep cranking, keep cranking. Good. Oh, it looks beautiful. Let's freeze this picture. Go back and take a look at it. Nice little record buffer that we have in here. 
and uh, you can clearly see in this picture, guys, that we have an ignition event that is now taking place at or very, very near top dead center. Um, I'll freeze it here for a second, maybe try to get a, you know, really it's not necessary. I mean, if you look at this picture, there's really no reason for me to put a cursor in here and take measurements. Um, that blue line, let me just look a little closer here. That blue turnoff of this uh, square wave, again, that's coil uh, control signal, that's the base circuit, is almost exactly at the peak of that compression hump. Uh, there's no way putting a cursor in there is, that, is really gonna help me because I would place my cursor in the same exact spot. And so what that says to me is this timing is now occurring basically at zero degrees. Ti no timing advance during a crank. I believe this car is gonna start. Let's go back to the car and uh, see what happens. Okay, one other thought on this engine would be that, that this does actually have adjustable ignition timing, and it's done by moving this, what they call cam sensor. I think it's more accurately a, a uh, cam and crank sensor, but in any case, we scrapped this before we took it apart. Uh, we're not gonna worry about setting this. There is a procedure for setting this, and I'm gonna show you that real quick, just so you guys know that there is a way to do this with a timing light uh, and a scan tool. So. Uh, it's important that uh, if you ever change one of these that you make that make sure that that is set correctly All right, so I, I just have you guys uh, zoomed on my computer a little plug here for Mitchell on demand uh, Or snap on shop key basically same program Definitely for an aftermarket technician. This is my my best friend So this is where I get most of my information and you see there is a timing procedure for this vehicle and it involves uh, connecting a scan tool, selecting a mode on the scan tool, and then putting a timing light on this vehicle and aiming the light at, uh, looks like the harmonic balancer, there's a, there's a mark. It says ignition time, it should be four to six degrees before top dead center at idle speed. Um, and so there is uh, a way to do this. It says set timing light to number one ignition coil harness. So I would imagine uh, it might have to be a little creative in, in a way to trigger a conventional timing light uh, because we don't have spark plug wires, but just wanted you guys to know it can and should be done on a job like this. Okay, um, I think uh, I would like to give you guys a real situation. Seriously, we have not tried to start this car yet. So, um, you know, hopefully it doesn't make all kind of crazy noises. Um, go ahead and give it a shot. Wow, that is initial crank, initial startup. Not overly concerned about that little bit of a little bit of a roughness there. You gotta remember our, our cylinders were all fuel fouled. We also uh, have a potential, actually I hear a hiss, maybe we got a vacuum line off. Um, no sweat on the smoke. I mean, we had oil everywhere on this thing, so there's oil all over the exhaust manifold. And we'll grab it a couple times. Yeah, definitely hear a hiss. Looks like I got a vacuum leak. That is a fix. I'm gonna pause this, see if I can find that leak. Well, I found the vacuum leak, pretty important, pretty important one. It's a big one on a mass airflow engine. Having the brake booster hose off, probably not a good thing. That sounds a lot better. Yeah, mass airflow engine with a vacuum leak. They don't like to idle very well. All right, that sounds good. I like it, one last rev. That is a fix. All right, one last comment on this video. Uh, I just wanted to thank our engine teacher, Mr. Jeff Kaplan, who is uh, one of the finest instructors here, for sure. One of many fine instructors here. 
uh, for letting me jump in on this job and, and uh, take these waveforms. Also want to thank the students who actually did a fine job on this with, uh, man, just one little, do we use the Bluetooth or the copper tooth on which sprocket? So really a little simple oversight. No big deal, we got the job done. Uh, one final thing would be, we're letting this engine run for the first time after the cylinder heads are off. It's real important to make sure the cooling fans turn on and turn off. And that'll tell us that we don't have any air pockets in the system. And so really that's the last thing that we're doing on this before we let this car go. Of course, making sure that the oil level's full and things like that. Uh, but that is a, a final fix. And uh, that was fun. Thanks again, Mr. Captain.